Hello there, listeners. It's Susie Nui from the Australian Society of Anesthetists, and welcome to our podcast. It's called Australian Anesthesia, and it's where we talk about all things relevant to anesthesia in Australia. Well, it's getting close to the end of the year, and I don't know about you, but phew, what a year it has been. However, in the world of the Australian Society of Anesthetists, our busy time is October. It's when we have our annual general meeting or AGM, and that's usually held during our National Scientific Congress, which is usually held every year, except for, you know. Every four years, pandemics aside, we host the Congress in conjunction with the New Zealand Society of Anesthetists, and that's what we did this year. So firstly, a huge thank you to the New Zealand Organising Committee for pulling together such a fantastic meeting. It was really great catching up with people face to face. Also, while I'm talking about it, I want to say a huge thank you and shout out to some of you like Tomoko, Michelle, Andrew and Lahiru, who came up to me to let me know that you've been listening to the podcast. It's always great to meet listeners in real life. So one of the things that happens at the Congress is our AGM or annual general meeting. AGMs mark time for our organisation. They're kind of like our birthday. This year, in 2022, we welcome Dr. Mark Suss, an anaesthetist from Melbourne, onto the board as Honorary Treasurer of the ASA. This year's AGM also marks the halfway point for our current president, Dr. Andrew Miller. So who better to spend time with in this podcast episode? Andrew came into the role with a wealth of experience, so we dive a little bit more into that, as well as taking a moment to reflect on his first year as ASA president and what he hopes to achieve in the next year. All right, well, let's get into it. Thank you. Thanks for giving up some time this afternoon. I thought this would be a good chance to catch up one year into your presidency. So maybe we'll start with, for people who don't know you, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm Andrew Miller. I'm an anaesthetist in private practice in Western Australia, and I have been for basically 22 years now since I came back from my overseas stretch of my training. My first consultant job was in Pennsylvania in Hershey, Chocolate Town, Fortunately, I didn't like the chocolate, so I didn't come back 10 kilos heavier. And I've had a portfolio of responsibilities professionally for some time now outside of anaesthesia as well. So I've been very involved in medical indemnity on the board and having for a period of time been president of MDA National and also chair of the National Council of Insurers. So I'm very familiar with the indemnity community across the country and negotiating with government in regards as far back as the current legislation that oversees the medical indemnity industry and things like the high cost claim scheme and so on. Been involved with the AMA on the Federal Council and as the West Australian President for some time. And I've been on the ASA board for about 12 years and was the Treasurer for about nine years until the annual general meeting this year when Mark Suss has taken that role on, thankfully. And what about your educational background? So my educational background includes a law degree, which I completed through Macquarie University in New South Wales and did my honours in health law. And also I have a fellowship of the Australian Institute of Company Directors and now have become a fellow of the AMA, for which I'm grateful to my colleagues there. So congratulations on that. Well, thank you. It's an unusual beast, the AMA. It's a medico-political body and it's complicated, but it is the best device that we have for advocacy to government. And it is imperfect, as are so many of our collaborative ventures in the profession, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't work pretty hard to try and make it better. And I suppose my involvement in all of these organisations and roles has been characterised by me wanting to change and improve rather than leave things the way they are. Thanks for leaving me really big shoes to fill as well on the AMA Federal Council. People talk very highly of you there. Well, the only reason people would say anything positive about me is that I tend to make a disrespectful tongue-in-cheek contribution to boring meetings and try to liven them up. And it's not entirely without a selfish objective to, I guess, stimulate people to think and to be engaged in what are otherwise incredibly dry topics a lot of the time, to be honest. But they're important things. And so if we can in some way make it more interesting and and provoke people to think about issues like ethics and medico-legal things, I was the chair of the Ethics and Medico-Legal Committee for some years and including revisions of disaster response policy and the euthanasia and voluntary assisted dying policy, And as an anaesthetist, I felt a particularly big responsibility in getting involved in all of that. So trying to make these things 
not so dry and more about people and more interesting is a role of mine. Whilst maintaining psychological safety too? <laughs> well, yeah, I make it equally unsafe for everybody <laughs> so that no one feels picked on. And I guess that provides a bit of safety in itself. So if I say, no, I'm sorry, you can't just repeat what the person in front of you said, then that might in some ways, I suppose, be a bit bullying. But I think people take it generally in the sense in which it's intended which is to really value people's time. You know, these are volunteers who are fronting up out of their professional hours to provide of their expertise. And we do need to have respect for that. And also for the people who don't push themselves forward to talk, you've got to create space for them in the meeting. Having a bit of a think about the way we run things and chair things is also really important for diversity and engagement of a wide range of people. Because if you're a busy young parent or you're a remote clinician, or you're a student or a trainee who's not used to being in these environments, you need to have a space where you do feel welcome, where you do feel like things are made a bit more interesting and where you do feel like you're not just going to have to listen to the same point being repeated over and over. Exactly. And hopefully not to sit there rubber stamping things either. Yeah, good preparation is really important. These meetings should not be simply people waving everything through. But the reason you have the meeting is the same as the reason you play the football game, is to find out what wins. And you can decide on paper beforehand which is the best football team, but it can turn out very different on the day when you listen to different points of view about something. And I know I've gone into a meeting before sponsoring something and pretty convinced that it was the right thing to do. To have vast areas of my ignorance revealed to me by people in there who were junior to me in some sense or had different experience to me in another sense and were able to prevent me from making a mistake. It takes a bit of humility to be able to pivot your thinking, especially mid-meeting. Yeah, maybe a good chair will provide a face-saving way of doing things. I'm not so bad with being humiliated, but I'm at a place in my career where I feel really self-confident. But I think the danger with committees is that Everyone and no one takes responsibility. And so I would come back to a concrete example of the Infection Control Experts Group, which I've publicly called for the disbanding of because I don't think it's fit for our purpose, for the way that it was able without really any public scrutiny, unlike in the US where the subcommittees of the CDC, for example, or the FDA have to either have their full meeting in public or at least publish all of their slides and their minutes and their reasoning to get picked over. We don't have that here. Mm -hmm. We get maybe a summary or a communication from the committee, but we don't get to question those experts and they're making very vital decisions for our workplace. And that was something that pushed my advocacy. And in the end, who takes responsibility? When aged care workers early in the pandemic were not being provided with airborne protections and people are dying in aged care facilities, I haven't seen any committee step forward to say we got that wrong. Good point. We had an ongoing advocacy regarding eye care, haven't we? Well, it's not meant to be personal. At times, the conversation gets very personal because we're talking about leaders. And in everything that we do with organisational structure, Miller's theorem is that 50% of your problem is policy and structure and governance, and 50% of your problem is the people who sit in those roles. And if we can't honestly talk about the performance of the people who are in vital roles, then that's not good enough for our patients or for our colleagues who go out on the front line each day. Because I can tell you, our colleagues certainly get scrutinised very closely as the individuals that they are. And if someone makes an anonymous complaint to ARPA about you or me, then we as people will get picked over like the crows are pecking at something on the road. And that's not a bad thing necessarily if it's done fairly and we have proper representation and a chance to understand the facts and answer for ourselves. But within committee structures and government structures and so on, a lot of these things that are in place seem to be there to distribute and devolve responsibility so that you end up with the farcical situation which was a silly example, but trying to find out who decided to use security guards in Victorian quarantine hotels. And in the end, the official decision was no one had made the decision. That's right. It just got made somehow by itself. <laughs> yes, exactly. So these are kind of some of my bugbears and some of the things that drives me to try and bring some honesty and transparency to these roles, because I feel if clinicians are going to be held to incredibly high standards, then so should the people who are our bosses, so should the people who are making decisions in regard to the health system. 
So I think that we can push back as a profession on these things, and I think that anaesthetists are ideally placed because we are leaders within our systems in terms of getting stuff done. I could see that having a law degree would be very handy to a lot of the work and shaping a lot of the advocacy that you've done. What made you want to study law? Well, what makes us want to study anything? You know, I decided to do medicine, I think, when I was about 14. So if I could find that kid and sit him down, I'd be interested to have that conversation. But, you know, my dad was an anaesthetist and so I was exposed to the area. There's this... I suppose, uh, disdain for the idea of following in the parents' footsteps and the idea of nepotism and so on. I don't think that privileged kids should be the only ones who get to go to medical school, that's for sure, because we certainly weren't well suited to be just unleashed on the world as a bunch of doctors who had no clue about large parts of our society or inequity or inequality and all of those things. But for better or worse, I ended up doing medicine and I did the standard three years of junior doctor thing And nothing had really jumped out at me except that I did enjoy procedural stuff. And at that point, almost on a bit of a whim, I applied to get into law school and I got an offer and I got a phone call from the dean who said, uh, I'm not sure about giving you this offer to do law because every doctor we've ever started in law hasn't finished it. So he said, I'll give you the enrolment if you promise me personally that you will finish the degree. And, you know, I rashly said, yeah, of course, no problem. And that was a UWA at the time. So. And this is before, before anaesthesia training? And this is before anaesthesia training. So I did two years of full-time law at UWA whilst doing general practice locums without a clue. And I learnt a lot from my patients and my seniors in general practice during that time. And that was enough to know that I didn't want to be either a GP or a lawyer full-time. So I came back to do what I thought was going to be intensive care. But having finished my anaesthesia training and put my law studies on hold, at the end of that time, I remembered my promise to the Dean of Law and went to re-enroll. But Macquarie University was offering a much better online and distance component, which suited the life of the young anaesthetist with a family much better. So went down that path and was grateful to have finished it because, as you say, it does equip you to, I suppose, deal with a lot of the things that we don't get trained in medicine and exposes you to large parts of the world that doctors can only complain about without really understanding where the levers are to improve things for themselves and their patients and the community. Mm, Great experience, as well as being a GP locum. Oh, you know, yourself, that a lot of your best stories from medicine come from the emergency department. And then before that, a lot of my most memorable patients will always come from general practice. I mean, it's not every day that the eight-year-old comes running in with the six-year-old and the three-year-old in the pram and the one in the prams had their finger bitten off by a rabbit and no one knows where their parents are. So these kind of adventures hopefully have a happy ending and a benign. Some of them are so tragic that It's hard even to think about them now when you get exposed to family and domestic violence and you come to understand that this is the lot for many people. I, you know, wasn't exposed to a lot of that as a child, although it can go across all demographics and into every postcode. But in general, I had a life of relative lower class, comfortable existence. Back in the 70s, when my dad was an anaesthetist, it wasn't the conditions and pay that we have in the public or private sector now wasn't that far ahead of general practice in terms of the lifestyle that they could afford. But I certainly, you know, hadn't had trauma or cultural disadvantage as part of my upbringing and general practice puts that right in your face. And the adventure that I went on with my multicultural patients in terms of learning so much from them was a really formative thing at the time of my career and that time of my life. And I'll always appreciate having had that opportunity. I do think we have a lot to learn from our patients, so well done for taking that on. Well, it's it's all been to my benefit and it's echoed these days in, as you would know, getting the opportunity occasionally to work in low-income countries or resource-deprived areas as giving anaesthetics. I want to come back to uh, the ASA. It's been a year now that you've been president, so what do you think have been some of the highlights for you in the last year? Well, I think the ASA is an organisation with great potential and what I'm trying to do is unlock more of that potential and build on the great work that you did as the longest serving president ever with your three year term, which was greatly appreciated that you uh, stepped up and took that on. Not quite three years, but it felt like a lifetime. (laughs) Well, I think you contributed above and beyond and so I've taken that as a responsibility to run with that. My presidency was always going to be a time of change because I think 
if you're not changing and improving, then you're going backwards, whether that's with your safety and quality standards, with your anaesthetic knowledge and practice. And it's the same with these kind of organisations. And I think the challenge is always, well, are we getting our money's worth? Is the organisation sitting on its laurels and there to serve the benefit of the organisation, provide a nice dinner now and then for the directors to get together? And I'm not saying this is what was happening before, and it wasn't, but what I think needs to happen is constantly be seeking a, a higher level of achievement and looking at opportunities. And I suppose coming from the AMA and being on the Federal Council there and then realising what is possible, if you know where the levers are, doctors like to sit and complain about stuff they've read in the paper and, and the milieu in which they're working without really understanding how it ended up like this. Like, who decided this? Who decided Medicare is going to work like this, the insurers are going to work like this? And if you didn't want to change any of it, how the heck would you do it? Now, a lot of doctors think that Medicare is all run by the health department, whereas, in fact, the financial side of it is largely taken out of their hands and run by finance and treasury, and that your advocacy needs to be a lot more sophisticated than this doesn't seem to be fair or this isn't working. You actually have to understand, A, who makes the decisions, who's responsible here, B, what are their incentives to have it like this and what might their incentives be to change it? How would you pull those levers if you could and what would be the professional way of approaching that advocacy in terms of making it happen? And how does all that tie into the media and the public conversation, the conversation in the commons, which is a caricature really of the sort of conversation that should be happening if the only position that you ever spoke from was science and ethical and compassionate policy for healthcare? What in fact you are dealing with is vested interest as well. As soon as you say, well, we can make it more efficient by doing this, then that means that there's a transactional cost because you're, you're upending things again. You want to change, it's like every time they bring a new chart into the notes in the hospital, and you're like, oh, I don't really want to put another sticker on yet another piece of paper when they told me this was all going to be paperless 20 years ago. So understanding all that is beyond the ability of a group of volunteer doctors just sitting around a committee table. What you need is a professional secretariat who have an engagement on an ongoing basis, long-term relationships with people like ministerial advisors, with ministers themselves, with influential backbenchers who on occasions are more important than even a minister in some regards. You need to understand also what the opposition and the crossbenchers think on these things. And that's before you've even dealt with the fact that the bureaucracy is its own head of power. The bureaucracy has its own philosophy. There are leaders within the bureaucracy who have their own ideas about where they want to go, whether that's a secretary of the Department of Health or whether it is the CEO of Medicare. They all have a view on how these things run. So our organisation as the ASA, to step up to the next level, uh, really needs to be connected into all of those things and where we have common interests with other associations, including obviously the AMA, but including other proceduralists in particular, and in general terms with other doctors and then with other healthcare workers, we need to exploit all of those alliances and be a real voice in the conversation. So my objective for the ASA is that if anyone anywhere is thinking of doing anything that affects the provision of services that we give, anything to do with critical care, anything to do with anaesthesia and intensive care, and anything to do with the environment in which we work, whether that's public or private, those decision makers should already know to think, well, we're going to have to consult with the ASA here, either because they can help us or because they will cause us a problem if we try to go in a particular direction. And that doesn't have to be self-serving because the needs aren't. And these are constantly put out, and it's one of the reasons I like our specialty is that we're imbued with a bit of humility by the fact that we're forced to work in teams. Rarely are we called upon to give an anaesthetic for nothing in a location where there's no other people involved. And that in itself drives compromise. It's a healthy thing. It means that in most cases, you don't see a lot of anaesthetic divas, whereas you do see them on the procedural side because they're used to being fated by the hospital. They know that the hospital CEO will lose their job if they leave in some instances. And so if they want to break stuff, they break stuff. But I think that it's healthy that we have an excellent, I think, track record since the 80s of pushing hard on innovation in safety, in quality, in always measuring outcomes, in trying to improve those outcomes. And I think to a degree that's unrecognised. And I think that's something we can be proud of, promote and try to be an exemplar. And I suppose coming back around the full circle, that's what I want for the ASA is for it to be an exemplar professional association, for it to be highly regarded by other medical professional associations and indeed non-medical ones. 
for its ability to get things done on behalf of its members and, you know, make it obvious to Anesthetists why it's a good thing to support. Do you think we're getting close to that? I think so. I think we've had a bit of luck and a bit of good management with the appointment of our new CEO, Matthew Fisher, in that I think he's well positioned and well experienced in many respects to understand that mission and to implement it. And so what I want the experience to be for people who are on our committees or who are our state chairs or who are organising educational events or who are members of the organisation is that essentially this is a service where they can provide their subject matter expertise painlessly, in fact in a way that is pleasant to deal with the organisation but fully supported and to have the corporate knowledge of the organisation properly captured in a way that we can exploit it so that when we go, as the example question from this week, when I do two microdiscectomies rather than one, is that a simple spinal procedure or is that different item number? That sort of stuff should be a reflex for the organisation. Yes, we have that knowledge already stored because we know the problem is that if our doctors go to Medicare, they'll get three different answers depending on who they talk to and then some silly precedent can end up getting set. And I think we've shown a degree of sophistication around our ability to deal with negotiations over public and private, and particularly some of these bundled care things that have been coming forward in assisting groups of anaesthetists who want to negotiate locally with satisfying the requirements to apply for an ACCC exemption, which, you know, anaesthetists have never heard of this, and why should they? They're busy worrying about whether the anaphylaxis is from the rock uranium or the sagamidex, and so they should be. So in terms of dealing with the parameters in which we work and the financial arrangements which we work and the educational and so on, we have the capacity there, we have the resource there. It's a matter of building that structure and the staff and having the vision to do it. And yeah, I think we're well on the path. You've got another year of your presidency, so I can see you're going to continue on that path. Is there anything else that you're hoping to achieve? Yeah, well, it's a short time. It's been 12 months of Zoom meetings and not getting to see people. And I have to say, getting to Wellington in Aotearoa, New Zealand, actually had more of a difference than I even imagined it would. It reminded me how important those little chats are around the side of the meeting and getting to know people a bit and understanding some of the stuff that they don't want to say in open meetings all the time because they feel either embarrassed or they're not sure of themselves and just working on those networks and connections. I've always been a really bad networker. I'm okay with decision making meetings, understanding policy and implementing stuff but in terms of meeting new people, getting to know who they are and what they have to contribute, that's not a natural skill for me. I'm one of those people who's very comfortable public speaking but Wellington was great. Seeing all those people was great. And it taught me again that it's a bit like exercise. You remember afterwards why it is that it's good, not beforehand. (laughs) So the next year will be more about developing those connections, having a lot of conversations with the membership and the stakeholders about how we want to take things forward, getting really sophisticated and slick in our new staff structure. So we've got good advocacy going to support our professional issues advisory committee and our economics advisory committee. I'm interested in the relationship with the College of Anaesthetists, who's our most important education organisation in the country. Obviously, the society originally, of course, gave birth to the College of Anaesthetists and pushed its separation from the College of Surgeons. Mm. And it's a critical relationship. And at times, it's been difficult to know, well, who's doing what? Because we provide continuing education, as do the college, and we do it in a combined fashion, which is much appreciated. And uh, I think that's a relationship which needs to be nurtured and managed and make sure that there's not too much duplication between the organisations, make sure that there's good alignment between the organisations, and then we can have a frank conversation where if the college is unhappy with something that we say or we're unhappy with the direction that they're taking, then those are things that we can talk about. And maybe it's fortuitous that Chris Kokos, who's an old friend of mine, is the college president at the moment because, you know, we're not on the phone every other day talking about anaesthetic business by any means, but we understand each other well and we both Mm. just want these things to work for the members and we both want them to be sustainable to the next generation because Australian anaesthesia is one of the best medical cultures in the world, has some of the best medical outcomes in the world, and these things are not guaranteed in perpetuity. When I talk to our colleagues at the Common Interest Group, it's interesting how much better our work conditions are compared to theirs. Well, not only that, but I think our standing too within the profession and the respect that we get from others and so on is based on something that's real, which is that we provide a service which is excellent. And to go along with that, we have to continue advocating for our members' conditions and for appropriate remuneration. We shouldn't be having anaesthetist standards of pay or Medicare rebates slipping backward year after year after year. 
And what we're seeing now is the widening of the out-of-pocket expenses for patients because insurers don't want to insure to what is a reasonably indexed rate over time, in my opinion. So we have to, in a legally safe way, and you know, in terms of competition, trade practices, law and everything else, not be the bunnies here because we are just doctors who don't understand business. Whilst we have multinational insurance companies booking billion dollar profits based on our work, it's not unreasonable that we have excellent remuneration for excellent provision of service and excellent training. And that's what a market economy does. So we don't have to be embarrassed or apologise for that. And neither should we for our public hospital colleagues also enjoying very good conditions which allow them to take the study time and the non-clinical time that they need to have time to do their teaching and to be prepared for things like the occasional pandemic. Exactly. I want to circle back around. You mentioned that you've always been very comfortable public speaking. You've got a good level of confidence. Don't seem to be shy of getting in front of the media. Have you always been that confident? Yeah. (laughs) Single word answer, I love it. (laughs) I can remember my father saying to me when I was about five years old, do you have a volume knob? (laughs) And there are many people who have wanted to find that over the years. (laughs) More latterly, I think I'm approaching 60 and you learn the amplitude of your EEG starts to reduce a little. Maybe the frequency slows a little. And it's not such a bad thing that you're not as quick to speak and you're a lot quicker to listen. And I know a lot of anaesthetists who are very good at listening and very good at thinking and working stuff out and very, very bright people. But they don't get to speak much on the public stage. They don't get to share those opinions much and I think it's a shame. And in some ways what I try and do is channel the brains around me that I have access to because I'm able to string a sentence together well enough that we've been invited to write a weekly column in the West Australian newspaper for the last year, which I keep sending in and they keep printing it. And it's an unusual thing to see the voice of an anaesthetist in some ways having an effect on the conversation that's going on in public, at least in this state. So, yeah, I've always been confident speaking about things. I've been probably wrong as many times as I've been right with some of the things I've said, but I'm prepared to be like Christopher Hitchens and entertain two ideas at the same time without going mad and without going any madder. Because I've got nothing to lose really in most of these arguments about things, I don't have vested interests in things and I have the benefit of not being a public state government employee so I can say what I like about the state government which has led to some ill-disciplined commentary from time to time which, by the way, doesn't do you any harm in the long term if you essentially you're a good faith actor. I think it's important to see doctors out there talking. The idea that educated doctors should be silenced because they're worried that if they express an opinion, their employer might not like it or APRA might not like it or someone might complain about them and even if APRA do like it in the end, they'll have a 12-month investigation hanging over their head for questioning a politician overruling their chief medical officer and saying, we're not going to worry about masks anymore. Then I think we've got a bit of a problem. And it's a difficult problem to tease out because you also have some pretty strange opinions amongst some doctors about Uh, Maybe we shouldn't do vaccination. Maybe we should be giving everyone bone broth and ivermectin. But I think if you're following the science and you're generally pushing in the direction of wanting to prevent, treat, reduce disease, then doctors should have better freedom of speech. And I think that that's something we can do a bit safer through associations. So for people who are worried, being involved in something like the AMA or the ASA, it's always going to be imperfect. You're not going to agree with everybody there, but that's the point. Otherwise, if you're only going to talk to people you agree with, you'll never go to a Christmas or holiday dinner at the end of the year again. Good words. Thank you. And hopefully that will encourage some more people to get involved and to speak up. Yep. Don't be afraid to speak up, particularly if you're doing it via an association. That's a good, safe way to do it. Thank you for speaking up. Thank you for spending time and speaking with me tonight as well. And I look forward to more of our ongoing conversations and seeing what happens with the rest of your ASA presidency. Well, it's a real pleasure, Susie. Thank you. And thanks for your leadership and for the podcast. I think it's really important that people stick their head up out of the operating theatres now and then and talk about these things. Thanks for your time. I always really enjoy chatting with Andrew and really owe him a huge thank you, not just for this podcast, but for his support during my time on the ASA board as well as as ASA president. And really, he continues to provide immense support to me and I know many others as well. 
During our conversation, Andrew mentioned a few things in there that I wanted to unpack. First, that he occasionally gets the opportunity to volunteer to work in low-income countries. Now, if this is something that interests you, then I encourage you to get involved with some of our global health projects. You can also register your interest in our overseas volunteering database. And that means that we'll notify you of any upcoming positions from other organisations. So essentially, it functions like a matchmaking service between anaesthetists and other agencies that are looking for anaesthetists. The other thing that Andrew mentioned is the recent discussion on whether two microdiscectomies is a simple spinal procedure and which item numbers to use. If you missed that conversation, that occurred recently on the ASA forum. Now, the forum is a secure chat group where ASA members can ask questions like that and get answers from each other. Often, our Economics Advisory Committee chair will add to the discussion so you know that you're getting the most up-to-date information. Basically, think of it like a secure Facebook group, but professional. Andrew also mentioned negotiations about public and private, as well as ACCC exemptions for local negotiations regarding contracts, etc. So we happen to have podcasts on all of these topics, as well as one on Contracts 101. The best place to find the full versions of these episodes is on the ASA member website. In fact, the best place to find the OJEC database, access the ASA forum, all the things I've just mentioned is by logging onto the ASA website. And I'll include links to all of those. Now, finally, if you're not a member and enjoy this podcast and want to listen to more about anesthesia and leadership, then we have a collection of relevant podcasts on the ACE Leadership and Management SIG page. ACE stands for Anesthesia Continuing Education, and it's a tripartite arrangement between us, the ASA, as well as the college, that's ANSCA, and the New Zealand Society of Anesthetists. The website is ASEC, which is A-C-E-C-C.org.au. And there you'll find information about all the special interest groups that our three organisations oversee. I want to say a huge thank you to Michelle in New Zealand for reminding me about that place to find the podcast on leadership and management. And of course, I'll put a link to it in the show notes. All right. I hope you enjoyed getting to know Andrew a bit more. I hope I see you at the National Scientific Congress. Next year, it's in Melbourne, which I'm really excited about. And it's also in October. And until then, I hope you're catching waves at the beach rather than catching COVID. And of course, staying safe and well out there. You've been listening to an episode of the Australian Anesthesia Podcast, which can be found on all the major podcast hosting platforms as well as YouTube. This podcast is produced by the Australian Society of Anesthetists and hosted by me, Dr. Susie Nu, with music created by Dr. Mark Sus. The Australian Society of Anesthetists was formed in 1934, and our vision is for every anesthetist in Australia to be at their best, providing the highest quality anesthesia and perioperative care through excellent technical and non-technical skills. We also hope this means that you are functioning at your best when you are away from work. In this podcast, we have conversations that seek to inform, challenge and inspire so that you keep performing at your best. Members of the ASA can access full versions of all the episodes by logging into the ASA website, which is asa.org.au. If you are listening on your favourite podcast app, then feel free to follow or subscribe so that you can receive the latest episodes as we do publish regularly. If you have any questions or feedback, please feel free to email us on asa at asa.org.au. We hope you enjoyed listening.